Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Good evening. I'm Cindy LeBlanc, and uh, I'm not one of the comedians. I'm only here to introduce them. I'm the uh, director of Up Time. So thanks so much for coming. Um, you know, this is our fifth show at the library, and they're all so much fun. We're good. Uh, yes, can you believe it? Uh, I know, I know. It seems like more, right? <laughs> and anyway, we're really happy to be back. This is our favorite place, my favorite place especially. And I think many of you here know that this library it's really a New York treasure. I'm going to have the library for a minute. It's really a New York treasure. I mean, this is such a, a wonderful, wonderful haven for writers and also for readers. And for this reason, it really creates a very special audience here. So I think this is really unique in the city, this library and this group. So it's really so much fun to put the show together for you and to gather some of the funniest people in town and to bring them here to this group. So uh, I'd just really like to thank all of our performers for coming. And uh, as with all of our shows, we like to mix up the, the styles, the comedy styles. So we usually try to have a variety of styles of humor. And so tonight we have a especially interesting lineup. We have two brilliant rising young stand-up comedians, Emily Blotnick and Jocelyn Chia, and one of our favorite writers, Jim Shepard. And we have a physician, Dr. George Lombardi, this is a first. Uh, he is also a master storyteller. And uh, James Harvey, a musician, is a music musical comedy writer and also a comedian. James will also be playing keyboard tonight. <laughs> and so anyway, it's uh, really always a pleasure to be in this gorgeous member's room. And um, you know, this is a reading room most of the time. So let me tell you, it is very, very quiet, very, very calm. And what a surprise. It turns out to be a perfect place for comedy. <laughs> it's really it's a, it's a perfect place to have a great time. And that's exactly what we plan to do tonight. So thank you all for being here. <laughs> and because we're at the library, we will start with the writer, Jim Shepard. And he is the author of a book with the most terrific title, Like You Understand Anyway. I think Jim, we understand, we understand, so you can you can come up. <laughs> Jim is going to read a piece tonight. So. Hi, as you just heard to your dismay, I'm not a comedian. <laughs> You're all like, didn't I pay money for comedy? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about my mother, and then I'll get off. Um, when my mother died five years ago, a family friend wrote to say that um, one of the things that he loved about her was that she was never afraid to speak her mind. And saying that my mother was never afraid to speak her mind was a little bit like saying Joe Stalin was willing to take charge of things. <laughs> my mother was born Ida Picarazzi in Strangolagali, Italy. And the town's name roughly translates as Strangle the Frenchman. <laughs> And if you had met her, you would have thought, yeah, that, yeah, that's important. <laughs> um, observers could tell from low-flying aircraft that my mother came from what used to be called party peasant stock. And, um, and when it came to the social niceties and interacting with her family, my mother had the touch of a blacksmith. <laughs> when agitated, she was something to behold, and she was always agitated. She had a voice that could not squirrel some trees. <laughs> I remember a boy who lived two streets away from me, two streets away, telling me on the bus to school one day that he'd heard me being disciplined the night before. He goes, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> she was half deaf, or as she got older, more than half deaf, thanks to a punctured eardrum from childhood, which meant that even when she was trying to be discreet, like say when she was sitting in a theater and needing help with a movie's plot, Everyone around her in a wide, wide circle had the uncanny impression that my mother was speaking directly to them. <laughs> what is this? I thought he was dead. <laughs> Isn't he dead? 
over the years, there were a lot of lessons I learned from her way of setting an example. Some were straightforward, like the advantages of beating your children with a wooden spoon as opposed to a metal one. <laughs> Many of her most vivid examples, though, were probably negative ones. Let's say she helped me learn to value a lot of things through their absence. The importance of calm, for example. The value of restraining your impulse towards verbal abuse. The keys to being a good listener. One key, it turned out, involved being able to hear. Or the willingness to be forbearing, as opposed to just throwing yourself head on into an argument. My parents fought so much when I was growing up that when no one was yelling in the house, I wondered if someone had died. <laughs> Ours was not one of those families in which the tensions were played out in intricately subterranean gestures. <laughs> My brother and I didn't have a lot of advanced training in the area, but even we could sense that as far as our parents' emotional lives went, there were certain compatibility and empathy issues that were not being properly addressed. <laughs> Certain emotional goals were not being well met. Of course, my brother and I didn't help, since we tended to demonstrate over and over again, through our heroic refusal to acquire common sense, <laughs> that we had the collective reasoning power of a chipmunk. <laughs> my father's way of putting it, and I, I have to apologize to the, to the venue, but my father's way of putting it was that we could fuck up a wet dream. <laughs> We do things like get come. We, we do things like get caught jumping off the roof of our neighbor's house in our attempt to conceal that we've been poking around the ground floor uninvited. Why are you jumping off the roof? She would have been mad if she'd found us in the kitchen. <laughs> and Ida might demonstrate her disappointment with our judgment, as she did in that particular case, by swinging the humidifier she had just filled across the length of the kitchen. As I recall, at the reservoir's rubber sealed cap ricochet off the ceiling. Ida also had that generation's characteristic response to their children's complaint that they shouldn't employ violence. That outraged sense that they would reestablish the parental prerogative by employing violence with every single syllable of their response. You know that one? I'll show you who can't employ violence. You know that one? <laughs> but Ida wasn't only our local version of war-torn Syria, she was, also, <laughs> she was also my first introduction to the complexities of epistemology. More than anyone I knew, she demonstrated just how mysterious a thing identity really was. Who are we really? Can we ever really know? One thing that was clear to me growing up was that my mother didn't. She had a staggeringly hard time keeping faces and names straight, even within her own nuclear family. <laughs> Over the years, she called me without irony, Guido, Mario, Johnny, Agnes, Jean, and Hey You. Without Ida, I wouldn't be the sad and emotionally battered figure that I am. <laughs> but I also probably wouldn't have become a writer. An obvious and crucial characteristic of writers is an appreciation of both the power and the limitation of words. And I have to tell you, being around my mother was a crash course in the limitations of words. As my father said about her, she had all the correct words in her head. It was getting them in the right order that was the problem. Ida brought together an unusual combination of a sixth grade education and a determination to lecture on any and all subjects. <laughs> and so nobody did malaprops the way my mother did malaprops. She told us to stay away from strange animals in the woods because those animals could bite you and give you rabbis. <laughs> she told us that she knew our neighbor was wealthy because he had an ingrown swimming pool. <laughs> She told us whenever she had a tough decision to make, but as far as she was concerned, you know, it was eight of one, half dozen of another. <laughs> she told us that her brother Guido was so generous he would give you the skin off his back. <laughs> and she told a friend of mine that my favorite monster movie, when I was a kid, hands down, was King Kong versus Gonzalez. <laughs> Which, by the way, is not a bad sequel. And she warned us every time at family gatherings 
when we were eating squid, not to just eat the heads, but to make sure we also got some of the testicles. <laughs> <laughs> now, maybe unsurprisingly, for a woman who was raised in a dirt poor region of Italy during the Great Depression and who loved her family, my mother was probably the single most schizophrenic combination of frugality and generosity anyone has ever encountered. Shortly before she died, she was thrilled to be able to send eight packages of gnocchi that she had scored at a job lot for a dollar a package to her sister in Virginia. Because as she pointed out, her sister could never find gnocchi for that price. The gnocchi cost me $36 in postage to make. If she had found out, it would have killed her on the spot. In the Midwest, I remember once being floored to have come across a marketing strategy apparently designed just for my mother. It was a billboard that read Miller Beer because Budweiser is just too darn expensive. <laughs> if something was enough of a bargain, it didn't matter what it was. Someone would like it. Ida was always finding at sidewalk sales for her ungrateful sons Things like open-toed red suede shoes. <laughs> or cable knit v-neck sweaters that left you bare-chested all the way down to the navel. <laughs> Ida, if shit went on sale, you'd buy a barrel, my, her brother told her once, in front of ten-year-old me. And ten-year-old me, after ten years of shopping with my mother, added, no, she'd buy two and freeze one. <laughs> For my first day of eighth grade in a very tough public junior high school, my mother bought me a white leather vest with a four-inch fringe all the way around the bottom. <laughs> the last time I had seen something like that, Roger Daltrey had been wearing it at Woodstock. <laughs> when I asked if she thought I was going outside with that on, she said what she always said when she came home with a shirt from the dollar store or an 87-cent belt or a bathing suit from one of the consignment shops in Florida, what my father called dead man's clothing. <laughs> oh, please, all of the kids are wearing these. The first time I came home from college, I found her sitting in the kitchen table, at the kitchen table with a disturbing smile on her face. And she refused to explain why. And finally, she told me to go upstairs and look at my room. My room turned out to have been painted purple. The walls were a deep lavender, the floor had a wall-to-wall -wall bright purple shag rug, and somehow she had found a dark purple stain for all of the wooden furniture. I came downstairs and she was still smiling. Why is my room all purple, I asked. The Vikings, she answered. Why is my room all purple, I asked again. You like the Minnesota Vikings, she explained, as if I had forgotten. I like to watch them play. I, said. I don't want to live in their color. It turned out that she had spotted the rug at a going out of business sale. Somehow that bright purple shag rug had still been available. Think about that. Besides having installed a rug that probably lowered the resale value of our house by $2,000, <laughs> she had lugged all of my furniture downstairs and outside and had stained it all purple piece by piece, and then had hefted it all the way back upstairs. She probably wrote my poor father into the project as well. It had probably taken them three full days to make my room that horrifying. <laughs> Ida would have been one of the first to tell you that she didn't get depressed. And I'm willing to back her up on that, although boy, could she get unhappy. <laughs> she liked to say when she was happy, she lit up a room. But when she was unhappy, well, I've seen grown men run out into traffic rather than face that. <laughs> Ida was, I hope it's clear by this point, what we used to call a force of nature. Whatever else she was, <laughs> <laughs> he said, coughing to death. <laughs> Whatever else she was, she was a continual reminder not to do things halfway. When she wasn't beating us or screaming at us, she was loving. When she wasn't incredibly disappointed with her family, she was devoted to it. 
for all of the battering. All of us turned out to have been unbelievably lucky to have been in the track of her storm. Wherever Hurricane Ida passed, there were branches down and there were leaves all over the place, but when the rain stopped, it turned out the clouds were washed and beautiful in the sky, it's pretty much gorgeously clear. Thank you, everybody. Next up, we have a, a first for a, a fan of night. We have a physician. Uh, Dr. George Lombardi, who is also a wonderful storyteller, and um, tonight uh, he has, he's going to tell us a story that, in some ways, it's like a classic hero's journey tale, but uh, that's just part of the reason it's so unforgettable. So please welcome Dr. George Lombardi. <laughs> Saturday afternoon in uh, 1989, and I was home alone in my Manhattan apartment unpacking boxes, and the phone rang, and a woman uh, who I did not know uh, started to interrogate me, and she asked me, are you Dr. Lombardi? Are you Dr. George Lombardi? Did you live and work and do medical research in East Africa? Are you a specialist in infectious diseases? Are you considered to be a specialist in tropical infections? And would you consider yourself to be an expert in viral hemorrhagic fevers? At this point, she paused and she uh, to catch her breath, and I jumped in. I said, who are you? Why are you asking me all these questions? And she apologized, and she introduced herself and said she was the personal representative of a world figure and a Nobel laureate and someone who was suspected of having a viral hemorrhagic fever, and she was calling to ask if I would consult on the case. Now, I thought this was some kind of a rude, practical joke, as I was 32 years old back then, and uh, I had just moved back to New York, my hometown, and I had opened a small office, and I had no patience. And, uh, the phone never rang. I remember sitting in my office and staring at the phone, trying to will it to ring, and the Verizon repairman who came out and said, the phone is not ringing because no one is calling. <laughs> but she convinced me that she was legitimate by mentioning a colleague of mine who told her, uh, you know, why don't you call George? He knows a lot about weird things. So she arranged a conference call, and about 30 minutes later, I was transported uh, 12,000 miles through these staticky uh, phone wires to a small hospital uh, in Calcutta, India, where I learned for the first time that the patient was Mother Teresa. And on the line were her two uh, main Indian doctors. Now, we talked about the case for close to an hour. And though those details are a little hazy uh, with the passage of time, what stuck with me and stayed with me was their deep uh, worry, their deep abiding concern for their patient. I mean, these, these two doctors were very worried. I, uh, I wished them well as I got off the line and I went back to unpacking my boxes. Uh, she called about an hour later. She said, you know, they were very impressed by what you had to say and I've been on the phone uh, for the past hour. Uh, I'd like to send you to Calcutta uh, I can get you out tomorrow afternoon, Sunday afternoon, uh, the first leg of the journey would be on the Concord. And I said, well, you know, that's, I'm sorry, that's, that's impossible, as I had just found in one of these boxes my, my passport, which had expired <coughs> roughly three months before. And she says, oh, that's a minor detail. She says, just meet me, meet me tomorrow morning, Sunday morning, 7 a.m., uh, downstairs in front of your apartment. Well, as you might be able to tell, you know, I'm pretty much a guy who does what he's told. So <laughs> the next morning, 7 a.m., she comes barreling down the avenue in a uh, wood-paneled uh, station wagon with bad shock absorbers. And the first stop, stop was the uh, passport office at Rockefeller Center, where on a Sunday morning, a State Department official came in, took my picture, took filled out a couple of forms, and in about 15 minutes I had a brand new passport. Mm -hmm. 
Second stop, you know they offered that service. <laughs> Second stop was the Indian Consulate, where again on a Sunday morning, uh, the entire staff came uh, in full uh, dress uniform, as I recall, and they offered me an honor guard procession that I walked past into the Consul General himself, who affixed the visa the Indian visa to my passport, and as he did so, he leaned in and he said the following. He said, uh, we bestow our blessing on you, my child. The eyes of the world are upon you. <laughs> <laughs> so I certainly knew who Mother Teresa was, but I was about to get schooled in not, what she, what, not just what she meant to the Indian people, but what she meant to the world. So I got back in the car, I clapped my hands. I was getting into we're next. I was I was I was getting charged up. She says we're ahead of schedule. I'm taking you home. I have some errands to run and I'll pick you up at 11 a.m. Sure enough, 11 a.m. tires squealing, she pulls up with one addition. In the second seat of the station wagon were five sisters of charity, five nuns who were wedged in to the second seat sitting bolt upright as if on a perch, as I recall. And I got in the front seat, and we made introductions, and um, they started to give me things. Uh, you know, small envelopes, packages wrapped in burlap and tied with twine. If you see Sister Raphael, please give her this. If you see Sister Narita, please give us this. So I was kind of like a courier. Uh, it's all before Homeland Security. <laughs> and, and as we're heading off to JFK, I, I asked uh, Sotto Voce, why, why are the nuns, why are they coming? Why, they could have just given you these packages. I don't understand why they're coming to the airport. And I was told, uh, well, I don't have a confirmed ticket for you on the Concord. So my eyes widened. And she says, the sisters are going to go up and down the line of ticketed passengers and beg until someone gives up their seat. <laughs> so I stood off to the side, just out of earshot, as I watched this scene unfold. And these five good women, these five uh, women of God, uh, surrounded the first businessman. <laughs> and he looked at them and listened, I could tell, quite intently. He looked back at me, and he looked back at them, and he shook his head. He said, I'm, I'm so you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't help it. They moved on to the next person online. And now I could hear their voices, which clearly had been raised, and they were, they were kind of flailing a little bit. And so they were very agitated and excited. And, and this poor guy, he, uh, he gave up his ticket in about 30 seconds. He just, <laughs> he just wasn't going to. He, he realized he couldn't uh, fight with them. They came towards me, these five women, in a line. And they, they offered me this. They came towards me and they handed me this ticket as if it was an offering. And they had small, upturned smiles on the edges of their face. Uh, the, the nun equivalent of a high five. <laughs> and uh, I wagged my finger at them. I said, I, I saw what you sisters just did. You are really little devils, and I'm going to tell Mother Teresa, and you're all in big trouble. <laughs> anyway, they laughed. <laughs> it broke the tension. Next up, Calcutta. 24 hours in flight, 100 degrees, 100% 100 humidity. And I was met. Uh, on the other side by my own personal private security detail of nuns who <laughs> formed a flying wedge and took me right through baggage claim and customs and delivered me forthwith to the hospital, my, including my luggage. And the doctors were waiting for me. And uh, no, no niceties, no introductions. What's wrong with her was their first question. I said, I said, I don't know. I, I just just got here. I said, I'd like to see the patient. So we went to the room, and uh, that Mother Teresa was in, and she was surrounded by, uh, always, by her sisters. And uh, introductions were made, and she beckoned me to come closer, and she called me forward, and I, I thought I was about to receive another blessing, and she said the following, 
I will never leave Calcutta. It's not an option. Uh, if you can help the doctors here, so be it. Uh, but I will not have them embarrassed or humiliated uh, in any way. She says, I need them. They run my hospitals and my clinics. And she shooed me away. She just kind of banished me. So I went to examine her, which is you know, what a doctor should do. And, uh, <laughs> and every time I had my stethoscope, every time I tried to take her gown down to listen to her heart, they lifted the gown up. I pulled the gown down, the sisters lifted the gown up. And this kabuki-type dance went on for several minutes. <laughs> and they just out of sheer exhaustion, I just, I, I banished them all, they, they had to leave. I finished my exam and I did what an infectious disease specialist does. I did my culture plates and my zank prep and my buffy coat smear. Etc. And I and I we agreed. The doctors agreed we would meet as a group tomorrow, first thing Monday morning. So I went down to the lobby of the hospital to uh, look for my ride, and I, I walked out of the lobby and I walked through the entrance and out into uh, the parking lot, and I saw this. It's now dusk. It's this orange glow, and uh, I, my eyes were adjusting to the light. And uh, I realized that what I was staring at was approximately 10,000 well-wishers, uh, 10,000 uh, pilgrims, if you will, uh, holding a candlelit vigil. So I fought my way through, and I got into my car, and we went directly to the hotel where I poured myself a, a, a double. <laughs> and uh, I ordered room service and I, I turned on the TV thinking that the local news would somehow distract me from you know, the day's events. And there I was on the local TV news, uh, video footage of me uh, that night and every night. Uh, footage of me, uh, the same footage I find of me entering <laughs> and leaving the hospital. <laughs> Uh, with the journalist, uh, the journalist's remarks were uh, Dr. Lombardi's come from America to attend to Sister Teresa as she marches closer to death. And I was struck by that. Um, hmm. That still bothers me to this day. Uh, the next morning, we, uh, we, we, we all met. The doctors met every morning, twice a day, actually. We met first thing in the morning and at the end of the day. And uh, she was clearly, uh, uh, clearly getting worse. And uh, she wound up uh, on a ventilator in, in their version of the intensive care unit. And uh, she was in the throes of what is known as septic shock, uh, which is described, was described as the root unhinging of all the mechanisms of life, and it's a description that's 150, made 150 years ago, and it is as apt a description today. Things brightened a little bit on the third day because the most beautiful sight I've ever seen was that these culture plates that I had poured on the first day had small dewdrop colonies on them, and this is a sign of a bacterial infection, and this was an important clue in the diagnosis and uh, I had a concern that a pacemaker that had been put in several months before could be seeding her blood and, and causing the sepsis. And the other event that happened on the third day was that the Pope's cardiologist uh, arrived from Rome. Now, he was a very uh, handsome man and uh, straight from central casting. He had, a, he had a head of silver hair and a Brioni suit. <laughs> an Hermes tie and Gucci loafers and uh, when we met as a group and I told the doctors excitedly because I knew I was on the right track that uh, this was sepsis it had a bacterial you know, mechanism to it and this pacemaker that had been put in I didn't know this at the time, I found out later, they put in under the instruction of the cardiologist I just described. <laughs> and I said, this pacemaker is, is the problem. And he erupted Vesuviously. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely.
absolutely out of the question, he bellowed. And um, he said, this is an absolute case of malaria. Well, I've had the good fortune of working as a doctor all over the world, and if they could diagnose the malaria anywhere in the world, it would be on the subcontinent of India, and, and this was not the case. Anyway, the next day, day and a half were, were brutal. Uh, she was slipping away, and I had dreams. I had dreams that she was uh, falling just out of my reach. This happened 30 years ago. And on the fifth day, I changed my tactic. And instead of entering the hospital through the side door to avoid, uh, you know, the crowd, I walked through them. And I was recognized from this film footage on TV, and I was embraced by them and I was bolstered by them, and, uh, and they gave me courage. And uh, we met as a group, and I made an impassioned plea that this was septic shock, uh, that the patient was dying, and this pacemaker had to be removed. And I sat down, and Dr. Brioni, as I came to call him, <laughs> approached the lectern, and he carried uh, a small medical reference book that a lot of doctors have, the Merck Manual. Maybe you have it in your collection. <laughs> <laughs> he had the Italian version called Merck Manual. <laughs> and in a scene right out of Shakespeare, uh, as he spoke, he pounded this lectern. If you listen, boom, 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 to this American upstart, boom, I will not be held responsible. Hmm. And I looked around the conference table in this small, somber conference room, and I looked into the eyes of these courtly, elegant Indian physicians, and I saw that in that moment, in that instant, that they had lost respect for him in a fraction of a second. They asked us to wait outside as they considered their options. He sat there elegantly attired with two equally elegantly attired attaches from the Italian consulate. I sat there with my socks and sandals. And they called us back in about 10 minutes and said, we've decided to go with Dr. Lombardi. And this other doctor silently somewhat sullenly packed his bag, left the hospital with his entourage, went directly to the hospital, and flew out of the country. So I didn't want to lose the moment. I said, let's, let's get that pacemaker out. And I was met with, you want it out? You have to take it out. I said, I've never done that before. <laughs> But you, you, you're the one that wants it out. We, we don't want it out. You, you want it out. <laughs> so I was afraid they were going to change their mind. So I went down to the intensive care room, and uh, I got a, a basic tray, and uh, I got the most competent nurse on the floor, and I banished the nuns. And the pacemaker box, you know, came out fairly readily. It's on the, close to the surface, and anyway. But the wire that was sitting in her right ventricle, had been there for several months, was tethered into place, and it was stuck. And I just could not get this thing to budge. And I started to panic. And I remember uh, feeling very, very, very nervous. And, uh, and my glasses started to fog up. Anybody who has glasses knows that's a very unpleasant feeling. <laughs> And uh, because there have been stories that if you pull too hard, you can put a tear in her ventricle and she would exsanguinate into her chest and, and die in front of me. 
So in a most surreal moment, I said a prayer to Mother Teresa for Mother Teresa. And I put a little English on this catheter and it came loose. And I threaded that sucker out and I cultured the tip and I proved uh, to infectious disease standards that this was the cause of the infection. Well, she got better and uh, her fever went down in a couple of days, she was sitting up. The day after that, she was taking nourishment. And I thought <coughs> my time was up. I had, I had done what I needed to do. But they wouldn't let me go. And um, I was the only doctor in this group that could start an IV in the uh, fragile veins of a 79-year-old woman. And it's a skill I had acquired at Bellevue Hospital as a student in the 70s where I developed a knack of starting IVs in, in the hardened veins of drug addicts. I, had, I was really good at that. But I, I remember at the time, I'm saying to myself, I will never ever need this skill again. But anyway, there I was, there I was. They let me go, they, they allowed me to leave uh, about three weeks uh, later and um, they held a press conference and, you know, the world press was there. And that's why I feel I'm allowed to tell this story, because most of these details were really out there. And I, uh, I flew back. I flew back to my life, to my patients. I see some of them are here, to my wife. And, uh, and that was kind of that. And, uh, but the best part of the story uh, she lived another eight years, and she would come see me, which was nice, except that uh, she would come with her entourage, and they took up every seat in the waiting room. <laughs> and any patient that came in, one woman came in, she said, she walked in, saw about 12 nuns there, she says she thought she had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> but the best part of the story, which is ongoing, is that, is that I have an, an ongoing, continuous relationship with the sisters. So they're here in New York, and uh, they're all over uh, the world, and, uh, and they truly do God's work, however you may choose to define that. And uh, they were in not long ago, and somebody needed some paperwork filled out, and, um, and so they, the mother superior came in with two novices, two young sisters, uh, who probably were not even born when, I, when the story happened. But she asked me if they could go in the back and see some of the pictures from the trip, because I have pictures on one wall, you know, from 30 years ago. And I said, of course, of course. And they, they like to do that. They like to see the faces of the women they know now, of course, when they were 30 years younger. So they get a big kick out of that all the time. And, uh, and, uh, and one of the novices you know, squeezed my arm and she said, Dr. Lombardi, you, you represent a link to our past. I said, well, I'm deeply, deeply honored by that. And the other sister said, Dr. Lombardi, in the convent, we think of you as a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank you. 
it one more time for Rockstar Lombardi, everyone. <laughs> and what up, rich white people? How you doing? <laughs> and the one Asian guy over there working. <laughs> from Singapore, I went to an, oh wait, I can't do that joke, I saw what happened to Emily, Emmy. <laughs> so, do you want to hear it, Emmy? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Alright, don't, don't say I didn't warn you. So, I went to an all-girl Catholic high school, anyone else here? A slut? Yeah. <laughs> Five people liked it, alright. So I was given a Chinese name, Pizza. I asked my dad what it meant, and he said, oh, your name means needs to be hardworking. I was like, wow, you should be called needs to be a better dad. <laughs> okay, fine, what does my sister's name mean? And he said, oh, her name means great beauty. <laughs> really? I'm your firstborn child and she gets great beauty? Can we go back to the good old days where the second daughter gets abandoned? <laughs> Like, do you really take your firstborn child into your arms, gaze upon my baby face and say, yeah, let's save great beauty for our second child. <laughs> this one looks like she's gotta work hard. <laughs> and my dad was like, okay, okay, calm down. It's better to be hardworking and pretty. Really? Do you know any guy who goes around saying, hey, um, you know what kind of girls I like? <laughs> that was a really great, oh yeah, work ethic. <laughs> yeah, check out that chick I got with last night. <laughs> Employee of the month. <laughs> last night we had a three-way conference call. <laughs> My brother was born at a time where parents were getting money for having a third or more child. So when he was born, my parents got $20,000. So his Chinese name is Xie Tian Shui, tax refund. <laughs> I came to America for college, I went to Indiana. Anyone else here? Suck at life choices. <laughs> He's a white guy, but he went to Harvard, so that makes him half Asian. Did you go to Harvard? No, my girlfriend's from Harvard. Your girlfriend? Where did you go? Uh, I was in Queen's College. Queen's College? Oh, loser. <laughs> uh, when I first met Michael, he was trying to flirt with me. He was touching my leg. He's like, oh, I love what you're wearing. What is it? I was like, oh, thank you. It's Pants. <laughs> First time he hooked up was very strange because he asked me, Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? I was like, He is Anthony Chia. <laughs> Why do you need to know my dad's name? This is how Americans get to know one another's family. <laughs>
and he said, "Parlez-vous français?" Which means you speak French. And I said, "Ni zhe ge da fen da da fei zhu shen jing bing wang ba dan ta ma de." Which means no. <laughs> Ah, English, English. <laughs> uh, who you daddy? Who you daddy? <laughs> I'm a life coach. He's always giving me dating advice. Like, oh, don't life worry. Coach. You'll find love when you're not looking for it. Just love yourself, and love will come. <laughs> I'm like, I love myself twice a day. <laughs> I am the only one coming. <laughs> But it's challenging dating in New York. You know, when I go to Davis White, get the guy with hair. Just so you know, I'm not looking for a relationship. Just got out of a relationship, but I'd be down for a hookup. Which I think is like going in an interview and saying, just so you know, not looking for a job. <laughs> just got out of a job, <laughs> but I'd be down for a paycheck. <laughs> I was so sick of this. I started using reverse psychology by being the first to tell men that I wasn't looking for a relationship. And guess what? <laughs> Guys really like that. <laughs> I once went on an eighth date with this guy. Eighth date when he told me he wasn't looking for a relationship. I was like, too late. You're in a relationship. <laughs> Tomorrow we're going apple picking. <laughs> Guy wants a millionaire, and he offered to fly me to Dubai. He was gonna pay for everything, so I had a fight because my inner feminist was like, "What? He's gonna pay for everything? Does he think he can buy you?" And then my inner Kardashian <laughs> was like, "What? <laughs> he wants to pay for everything? <laughs> Dubai? No, he buy." <laughs> no, if he pays for everything, you're gonna have to have sex. Oh my god, he's gonna pay for everything, and I get sex. <laughs> Hashtag winning. <laughs> I should be a life coach. <laughs> but I actually am dating someone right now. We have not had sex because I am old fashioned. I want to wait until he's 18. <laughs> Surprised by how much you like that joke. <laughs> <laughs> but have you heard that women tend to go for men who remind us of our dads? Emmy in therapy, did you talk about that? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know I go for men who remind us of our dads because my men always tell me how beautiful my sister is. <laughs> And I actually left my job to pursue my dream of being a comedian. And now that I'm living my dream, I dream of getting a job. <laughs> All of you with jobs, if you get hit by a car, you have health insurance. If I get hit by a car, I have to die. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the doctor the other day. Well, actually, now I have Doctor Lombardi, so I'll just give you a call. Hey, doc. <laughs> So I went to the doctor the other day, and the nurse asked me, "Oh, what insurance do you use? Blue Cross?" I said, "No, fingers crossed." <laughs> <laughs> and I feel so bad for my parents because I was a lawyer. Any lawyers in here? No, no assholes here. Okay, <laughs> it's a nice crowd. Uh, so I was a lawyer turned comedian, and my sister, she was an accountant. Now she is a DJ. <laughs> And my brother just quit his job to go find himself. <coughs> my dad was like, "When did our kids become white?" <laughs> Asians don't find themselves. We find the square root of pi. <laughs> hey, Asian, do your parents tell you they love you? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Asian parents don't say I love you to their kids. Yeah, I went up to my dad. I was like, I started telling him I loved him. Right? I was like, Hey, Papa. Uh, so we've been seeing each other for thirty years, and <laughs> I just want to let you know that I love you. And he said, "Ah, <laughs> I'm not looking for a relationship." <laughs> and my mom isn't supportive of my comedy career because she thinks there's no money in it. So I told her, "Well, Chris Rock made sixty million for his Netflix special." 
And she said, wow, does he like Asian girls? <laughs> I was like, mom, I'm not going to be dating the Chris Rock. She's like, I'm not you, great beauty. <laughs> Best friend, she's a New Yorker, but every time she gets into trouble, she'll just whip out a southern accent. Do you have any southerners here? Yes. Yes, and you know how charming your accent is to New Yorkers, right? So once we got pulled over by a cop, and she was like, Oh, Lordy Lord, is that Spaden? I was just trying to get home. Mom, mama, she's sick. I got chicken soup at the back of the car. I was like, Girl, at the back of the car is weed. <laughs> But it worked, so the next time I got pulled over, I spoke in Chinese. I was like, oh, what's it all? What's it all? What's someone put it all? And he's like, I know you speak English. I've seen your work online. <laughs> <laughs> but then he let me go because it turned out he is a fan of Asian porn. <laughs> Sometimes Americans cannot tell Asians apart, right, sir? Yeah. And you know how I learned this? <laughs> because back in college, when I went to the bars with my Asian posse, we could all get in with just one ID. <laughs> <laughs> and to use my dad's ID. <laughs> you know what? I flew in from from overseas just for this gig to entertain all of you, and I'm really glad I did. You guys have been wonderful. I'm Justin Chia. Thank you. in the room, which is that I am, um, I am bald, <laughs> and uh, you know, it wasn't always so easy for me to just come out and admit it, and when I first started losing my hair, I experienced all of these confusing, conflicting emotions, and I didn't really know what I was going through until I discovered something called the five stages of grief. Um, are any of you familiar? Yeah, it's, it's pretty well known, I would expect some of you to have heard of it. Um, so I thought I would share my story with you. Maybe if you're going through something similar, or if someday you go through something similar, you'll find some comfort in this. So, uh, stage one, denial. I've noticed hair on my bedspread, much like the hair from my own head. But that can't stop the way I'm feeling fine. There's lots of hair in my sink. Those clumps have sure got me thinking But I am certain that the hair's not mine Because I'm not going bald I'm not going bald I'm not going bald I'm not going bald Oh no, 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 definitely not going bald No, oh, oh Downtown for a trim in. My barber says that I'm thinning. I said, Habito, quit your joking. <laughs> I study my own reflection, see lots of scalp on inspection. I assume that mirror must be broken because I'm not going bald. I'm not going bald. I'm not going bald. I'm not going bald, oh no, 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 definitely not. Go and see the hair I've got growing, definitely not going bald. Thank you, please hold your applause till the end of the baldness suite. <laughs> um, stage two, and I'm not proud of it, was anger. <laughs> Haven't you seen a man losing his hair? Got something to say to him, don't turn away, go right ahead and stare. I know what you all think of me. How you giggle and shriek, so point at the bald man, laugh at the 
the bomb and keep making fun of the free. Anyone with a full head of hair, all you're good for is bringing me pain. Like that guy right there, it just isn't fair, he has that perfect mane. Bet you're proud of that mop you got. Got so fucking thick, well, point at the bomb and laugh at the bomb and Jesus Christ, what a dick. <laughs> A chance. You had to spread your balding jeans, you couldn't keep them in your pants. And damn all of society for shaming and for judging me, and damn the cruel and wicked God who made my hairline very flawed. If you think I'm a hideous monster, a monster is what I'll become. I'll make the world pay, and you'll rue the day you treated me like scum. When the hairless can rise again, how you'll crumble and crawl, so point at the bomb and laugh at the bomb. Until I murder you all. <laughs> that was cathartic. Um, stage three. Stage three is a bit more obscure. It's called bargaining. And basically, this is the stage in which you'll try anything to get back what you've been losing. So for me, this meant turning to modern medicine. And um, after many hours on WebMD and bodybuildingforum.com, I thought I found the perfect cure. A treatment of minoxidil combined with the Propecia pill is all but guaranteed to save my hair. If it costs a pretty penny, it's a bargain for the many ways I'll benefit and side effects are rare. I take a dose of medicine and right away it's kicking in my skin goes dry, my muscles start to wake. Some discomfort in my chest, but if it helps me look my best, it is a bargain I will very gladly take. It seems that I start gaining weight at rather an impressive rate, and I am not the slightest bit concerned. The dripping in my nose, the gentle tingle in my toes, and the way my scalp initially had burned are a bargain for the hair that has returned. Another minor side effect is that I cannot get erect, I urinate a hundred times a day. And despite the diarrhea, it's the perfect panacea, it's a bargain for which I am proud to pay. My feet are numb, my face is flushed, my heart beats in a frantic rush, I vomit and my vision is all blurred. But since hair stop stopped receding, it's the bargain I've been needing, even though internal bleeding has occurred. I black out for a day or two and wake up in the ICU Surrounded by a doctor and a nurse They tell me in detail the drugs have made my organs fail And if I don't quit I'll end up in a hearse But going back to being bald seems somehow worse So there I was, in that largely fictional scenario <laughs> Out of options, and in the most depressing stage of all Depression <laughs> What hair I've gained, without a doubt, will shrivel up and then fall out. I know the truth, I can't go on refusing it. I'm losing it, I had a life, a future planned. I'd find a love and take her hand. But no one loves a bald man, no confusing it. I'm I'm losing it, my sanity. I'm losing it. Hello, despair. Hello, frustration. My dignity. I'm losing it, virginity. Not losing it. Can I bear more humiliation? I wish the best to you, my friends. But this is where my story ends. Enjoy your hair. Now it's too late for me. And when the wreckage cleared, I knew I had to find a way to get to acceptance. The stage that sounds most like a cut song from Dear Evan Hansen. <laughs> All the sleepless nights I was fighting what I couldn't control. I thought having flaws meant that I could never feel like I'm home. Insecure in a haze, wish that I could I can't change what's past, I can't stop whatever's going to be. I can 
only look in the mirror and accept what I see. Used to run, hide away, didn't know I could face the fear. But now when it's here, I shave it off with foam and a razor blade. I shave it off and like that I'm not afraid. I shave it off, my white people problems fade. I shave it off and I am free. <laughs> when I lose my way, turn the shower on and I am reborn. Start again each day, lather up and like a sheep I am shorn. Breathe in and take a leap I shave it off The hair I once prayed to keep I shave it off And see what was just skin deep I shave it off And I swear Nothing feels as good As when the worst comes true And you wake up to realize That you
Oh, you guys are great audience members. I was like, let's go get me. It's like when I do readings, I'm like, find the good face. Um, but I was just saying to these guys, my Chinese mom has lived in New York for 15 years. When I say goodbye, I love you, she just goes, love. Wow. She goes, love? <laughs> At least that's better than thank you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> See ya. Bye. Bye. See you. Oh, 
I don't know. Well, I'm. 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 I'm.